Hello everybody, uh, today we're going to look at the game from the uh, 2016 Olympiad uh, between Grandmaster David Smearden with the White Pieces, who is about a uh, mid-2500s player against the world champion uh, Magnus Carlsen. This game was uh, very interesting to me because of the uh, rare opening system that was employed by the player. Uh, David Smearden with the white pieces. So let's get started. This game started off as a Sicilian uh, defense and uh, the variation played was uh, 2c3 and is known as the Alapin variation. And before we actually get in that game I'm going to show you um, just a brief uh, miniature game, a short game, just so you can see what happens when white gets his way so you can basically see the implementation of white's uh, main ideas in this game this game was played between two strong grandmasters of Genny Shreshnikov namesake of the Shreshnikov variation on uh, and um, Andre Sokolov and this game was played in Sochi 1983 so we're gonna just run through this really fast okay so that game started off e4 c5 c3 and the idea is real simple for white and it's just to build up a two pawn center with uh, d4 and if white if black does nothing about this then white will have a, a comfortable uh, position in an advantageous central uh, position akin to what he gets in the per per uh, modern defenses also against the French and uh, Carol Khan and we can get that uh, two pawn center up. The downside of C3 should be obvious, but you know, I know we have a lot of novice players and newer players. The downside of C3 is that it takes away the natural square for, for this knight. So now that's blocked. And uh, also, it does nothing to aid the development of any of the pieces um, that are resting on the back ranks right now. So, d5, this is a main move. Uh, d5 can be played as well as knight f6. Knight f6 was not played in this game. Um, but the idea is the same, just attacking the vulnerable pawn on e4. But I don't want to get on a tangent in that line. There's a lot of analysis. Um, that can be uh, researched but I want to stick to the game so d5 was played again challenging the e pawn immediately and you can see the relation to the Scandinavian defense where uh, right in the opening e4 d5 is played immediately the difference again is this is kind of like an improved variation of that because the pawn on c3 keeps the queen from being attacked by the knight as you'll see after e takes d5 queen takes d5 and notice the queen is immune to the move knight c3 and that's uh, the justification here for that so the game went d4 there's white trying to establish his center and the idea here now is that if black is the capture here on d4 isolated pawn situation will arise however the square c3 will now be open for the knight and the knight would just hop in to c3 and gaining time on the queen now when you play this you do have to be prepared as white to enter into isolated pawn scenarios where you're taking on pawn weakness for increased activity Okay, so e6 this is played by Sokolov. Knight f3, normal enough. Knight f6, knight a3. Now you might say, well, what's the idea? Knight a3. Well, black is delaying the capture of this pawn. And um, white ideally would love to bring his knight here, but black continues to delay and stall on the capture. And he has to get his pieces up so he 
plays this move knight a3 and there's a few ideas excuse me there's a few ideas behind that move uh, one of them is to play knight b5 after this capture and after knight b5 to threaten this fork here Another idea in this position besides knight a3 is to play a move like knight bd2 followed by bishop c4 attacking the queen. Of course another idea, of course with preparation, say after knight bd2 is to play c4 also. All designed to gain some type of um, tempi against the queen and basically make black pay for his early queen uh, movements. So knight a3 here is played. Bishop e7 my Sokolov. And there's knight b5, a real primitive looking move, obviously threatening the fork here. Knight a6, stopping the fork, c7 c4 there's another one of the ideas I mentioned notice that this check is possible now there it is another queen move but notice that the queen move does not even though it's with check white is still able to develop normally so bishop e2 he takes castles notice that again Shreshnikov is not concerned about recapturing the pawn immediately but he is more concerned about getting fully developed and exploiting the awkwardness of blacks pieces and his lack of development there's castles there's bishop d3 notice neglecting to capture the pawn queen to g4 and we see a lot of queen moves in the position development being neglected rook e1 Again, notice how fluid White's development is here in this position. Now the knight, <clears throat> knight goes to d7. Bishop returns to e2. Simply threatening this move with Tempe. Another queen move. And these are two strong grandmasters. So white finally recapture recaptures his pawn he has an advantage in space advantage in development and he has a three to two pawn majority on the queen side so this is an uh, ideal position for white here and I'll just show the rest of the game briefly rook to d8 again attacking the queen and notice that main idea of exploiting the queen it's early um, movements in the position. Queen moves again. Look at that. A nice move by Shreshnikov. Bishop g5 attacking the, uh, the queen here. Queen takes g5. There's the main idea. Bishop takes check. And f7. King takes f7, knight takes e7, excuse me, e6, forking the rook and the queen. Queen moves again to g6. And you can see the obvious nature of this move, threatening all kind of stuff. The winning material, winning the game. Black desperately tries to counterattack, and again, look at this the awkwardness, lack of development in the position. Double check from the knight and the queen. King goes back to f8. Another threat to a piece. Yeah. The 
bishop goes to c5 this piece cannot be captured because if bishop goes to uh, capture on d8 then the queen will simply go to d6 check and then that will <coughs> excuse me that will lead uh, lead to mate okay so Sokolov plays bishop c5 another piece comes in king moves to g8 and look at the dominating nature of the position and again I'll just give the moves briefly and we see here that white is winning white is up two pawns and also the exchange And again just so and I'll stop it right there and of course white went on to win win this game and I wanted to just give you a brief overview of white's intentions in that uh, system c3 now we're gonna look at the, the actual game okay so here's uh, GM David Smearden with the white pieces against Magnus Carlsen with the black pieces who's the world champion by the way Carlsen plays the same line that Sokolov played he takes d5 Queen takes d5 with all the same ideas that I mentioned notice that the knight is not able to go to this square this pawn right here is in danger of becoming backwards that's why we see this move right away Knight f6, and again, like I mentioned earlier, all types of moves have been played here. Knight c6 can be played, e6. There's many different uh, ways to skin, skin a cat here. Um, the line I mentioned earlier, knight f6, which is akin to like an Alicon's defense. And in this case, play would go e5, knight d5, and there's a d4 again and C takes and either Queen can play here or the pawn let's say it takes with the pawn then D6 again ch chopping at uh, white center as soon as possible Knight F3 Knight C6 and the play reminds me a lot of Alicon's defense Knight B6 Bishop B5 again it's all about this fight for the fight for this this center squares here D takes e5 excellent move of course white does not want to take because of the queen trade so he has to play this move we see his double attack here but then simply bishop d7 and one line goes bishop takes c6 bishop takes c6 knight takes B takes knight c3 e6 and this is actual game from uh, Shreshnikov and, um, and Walter Brown from 1979 and black is uh, perfectly okay isolated pawn here isolated pawn here and the game is equal let's get back to the game so d5 was played e takes Queen takes d5, d4, and again, knight f6 uh, was played, and um, like I said, e6 is possible. Also, delaying, delaying this uh, knight. I do want to point out here that um, the d4. Knight f6. What I want to point out 
is that this immediate move c takes d4 tends is is premature as as i explained earlier i just wanted to show you some kind of concrete line knight c3 and you see the pressure building up here knight f3 bishop g4 and knight c3 and notice with this pawn here blocking this bishop there will there is no bishop to b4 to, to pin this guy so this guy is actually attacked so after knight c3 bishop takes g takes and it looks like black is doing okay he has damaged white's pawn structure and he's gonna win this pawn here but after queen takes d4 queen takes d4 knight takes d4 right looking good right powerful move knight b5 and if if knight c2 check then simply king d1 knight takes a1 knight c7 check king d7 knight takes a8 e5 bishop e3 and black black is uh doing worse here uh, this knight isn't going this knight isn't going anywhere and meanwhile white will be able to preserve his back so this move immediately is not good it's premature knight f3 let's look at it one more time and another uh Another variation would be like, um, yeah, knight e6, just to protect here. Now, f4, the idea is real simple, just to push the guy away. a6, f5, something got to give, right? So, f5, a takes b5, there's the check, and the bishop, king d8, f takes e6. And um, we can see right here that white is clearly better here. And after knight c6, knight f3, bishop g4, excuse me, bishop e2, c takes d4, c takes d4, e6. Knight c3. Again, white white gets to go to where he wants to, and this gives this gives white like a slight advantage. At least here, black can play bishop uh, b4, but white has a nice active position with a lot of position potential. And these are the type of positions that white wants to have. So, the timing of this capture is very important. Okay, let's let's continue. So this is why we see knight f6 play right now, or move like e6. Knight f3. There's e6. Again, bishop g4 is perfectly legitimate, but this this move is also played. So e6 was played. Knight c3, and again, as I explained before. The idea is to go here and here, threatening this rook on uh, a8 and this queen here. There's other plans that have been tried. Bring the knight here and then putting the bishop here. This plan is also c4, attacking the, the queen and then following up with knight c3. And after, after I say a check here, bishop e2. 
So we see like a combination of different the the same plants. Here Smitten played the move knight a three. And even here the bishop can come here sometimes. Let's see what happened. He just went back. And this is just an admission, you know, it's a main move and it's just an admission my black like hey, I have to get my queen out of there. Now notice in contrast, if you remember the first game I showed you, the um, Shvechnikov Sokolov game, is um, Sokolov kept his queen here, and uh, his queen wind up getting knocked around. Like if you go back to you know to the beginning of the video and look at that first game, and tr and just count the amount of um, times the, his, the black queen was hit in that game, and ultimately probably the reason why he lost that game. Just taking too too many uh, hits to the queen, so of course wisdom prevailed over the years. That game was played in the 80s, and so players say, "Hey, let's just get the queen out of here." So queen d8, knight c4, and we see the pressure here building up. Bishop e7, and we see Magnus just playing real solid. That's one thing about in the Olympiads is you could play anybody, and a lot of the players are real strong, like 2,500 players, like very, very strong player. I mean, they're not elite, not in the top 10 or anything like that, but very strong player. And the thing is, these players like Carlson, Nakamura, uh, Fabiano, Caruana, etc. They're all used to playing each other over and over again in these top tournaments so they can prepare for each other. You know, they know NVL is going to play a certain line at a Sicilian or Kramnik is going to play the, um, you know, Petrov or, or uh, excuse me, um, Berlin Defense, something so they can prepare and go on their databases and, you know, they know. But when they're in Olympia, they're playing guys that are very strong but might play something, you know, that's offbeat. So these guys aren't prepared, and that creates exciting uh, matchups and scenarios. Like, you never see the Alapin Sicilian at top levels, you know? Now, of course, if these guys had time to prepare and all this stuff for it, you know, of course, white, you know, white, you know, black would probably equalize no problem, and that would be it. But that's what's cool is the surprise, the surprise value. You know, he's hitting, you know, like, like I would like to, like, bah, excuse me, I'm so excited, I can't even talk. I would like to see, like, King's Gambit or Budapest Gambit, just to see how these guys handle it just on a whim, you know, without having the excessive preparation and um, stuff needed like that. But anyway, so Bishop E3 was played. It's threatening to win a pawn, right? C takes D4. Queen takes d4. All right, so after queen takes d4, then castles, and we have a pretty normal position here. Now it's white who has to worry about the tempo against this queen here. But white has a, you know, a nice position, equal position, and a playable position. He has a three. The two majority on the queen side here for an end game, so he doesn't have the isolated pawn position, and his minor pieces are a tad bit better. So, only thing is, is that it's his queen now that's kind of in the line of fire, so to speak, from Black's minor pieces. Bold move. Here, by Smirden, is he castles queen side, and uh, so he's just gonna go and attack Carlson's king. Now, of course, he's also threatening with this rook lined up like that is to is to move the queen somewhere with the discovered attack, on the queen. Carlson plays knight d5. As 
ideas here the bishop again hitting the queen also just trading off the bishop here taking black's valuable bishop queen g4 Nice move by Carlson. There's a fork here. F takes e3. And now we see some weakness appearing in the Smearden camp. So we take stock here. White is more active. White is more active, but now has taken on some pawn weakness. However, by taking on that pawn weakness, he has given himself another open file, which is the F file. So, based on these factors, we can see the strategy that White should be employing here. And that is to utilize his activity to attack uh, the Black King here. The reason is, is Black really has no structural weakness. Therefore, if Black is able to catch up in development, and consolidate his position then he will be uh, better here so white's advantages are active peace play open files and that's what he has to try to use to um, develop an initiative of course black would like to consolidate um, calm down cool off if you will uh, whatever fire that white is trying to start here Black also has the two bishops, which are quite useless right now. But again, Black is looking forward to the future. Whereas White is trying to make his claim to fame right now. So after F takes E3, Queen goes to C7. Bishop D3, and we can see... We can see all, all of this potential buildup against the the uh, queen. And again, look at Magnus Magnus's form behind in development here. Knight d7. Again, notice the theme of the exposed queen. Queen f4. Now, interesting enough. We see a queen trade offered by Smearden now. And of course, this queen trade would help him out by reuniting his lost pawn. Now, black would still have the bishop here. And I think the game would be equal after a queen trade. But now Magnus says, no, I'm not going to help you alleviate your weakness. And he highlights that weakness playing queen c5 and in some instances even moves like b5 followed by bishop b7 and maybe rook coming to c8 is possible with the subsequent pawn storm on the queen side therefore before any of that can take place Smearden understands the gravity of the position and realizes that he must maintain activity in order to keep white, excuse me, to keep black from consolidating his position. And that's why you see this move which looks very loosening, but it's a critical position and white has to find a way to stay active and keep and keep the the initiative. Queen C6 Again, attacking the exposed queen, keeping the initiative. Very bold move by Carlson. Uh, I mean, it's an excellent calculator because a lot of people will lose this position with with the black pieces. I mean, we see danger. Rook g3. Again, offering the queen trade. And 
and smeared in uh, trades queens here. Now, the queen takes h4, bishop takes h4, rook h3, rook g1, and Smirnin settles for a draw against the world champion. And this is something that he can tell his friends and colleagues one day that he actually drew a sitting world champion and the strongest uh, rated, highest rated player in the history of chess. So I hope you learned a lot from that game. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I like seeing these kind of uh, offbeat openings, uh, you know, every now and then. And uh, like I said, you see that the uh, Alapin is not, uh, you know, a bad opening in itself from the white side. And in fact, it can be very dangerous. So it's definitely something, um, you know, to add to your repertoire. All right. So anyway, hope you like that. Hope you subscribe. And I'll catch you on the next one.